to my dear colleagues and most especially to our professor, Doc Cynthia, a pleasant morning to all of you. Our topic for today is all about organization and management in Philippine schools. This topic will be reported by Sakasak Wilin Lee C. and yours truly, Ness Vanya Mercy M. Intended Learning Outcomes Number 1. Categorize different organization models in Philippine schools. Number 2. Cite and explain specific structures and different organizational institutions in the Philippines. And number 3. Analyze the effect of given models of organizations in various Philippine educational institutions. The Education in the Philippines It is managed and regulated by the Department of Education, Commission on Higher Education, and Technical Education and Skills Development Authority. DepEd is responsible for the K-12 basic education. It exercises full and exclusive control over public schools and nominal regulation over private schools. And it also enforces the national curriculum that has been put in place since 2013. CHED and TESTA, on the other hand, are responsible for higher education. CHED regulates the academically oriented universities and colleges, while TESTA oversees the development of technical and vocational education institutions and programs in the country. The Different Organization Models in Philippine Schools Let us discuss first the DepEd Management Structure. The DepEd Management Structure To carry out its mandates and objectives, the department is organized into two major structural components. First one is the Central Office maintains the overall administration of basic education at the national level. And second one is the field offices. They are responsible for the regional and local coordination and administration of the department's mandate. According to RA 9155, an act instituting a framework of governance for basic education, establishing authority and accountability, renaming the Department of Education, Culture and Sports as the Department of Education and for other purposes. The department should have no more than four undersecretaries and four assistant secretaries with at least one undersecretary and one assistant secretary who are career service officers chosen among the staff of the department. At present, the department operates with four undersecretaries in areas of Number 1. Programs and Projects 2. Regional Operations 3. Finance and Administration and 4. Legal Affairs Under the Office of the Secretary at the Central Office are the different services, bureaus, and centers. Under the Services Department are Administrative Service, Financial and Management Service, Human Resource, Development Service, Planning Service, and Technical Service. Under the Bureaus are Bureau of Elementary Education or BEE, Bureau of Secondary Education or BSE, and Bureau of Non-Formal Education or BNFE. In the Bureau of Elementary Education, they are responsible for providing access and quality elementary education for all. It also focuses on social services for the poor and directs public resources and efforts at socially disadvantaged regions and specific groups.
In Bureau of Secondary Education, they are responsible for providing access and quality secondary education. Its aim is to enable every elementary graduate to have access to secondary education. While in the Bureau of Non-Formal Education, they are responsible for contributing to the improvement of the poor through literacy and continuing education programs. In the centers or units, we have the following offices, the NETRC or the National Education Testing and Research Center, the HNC or the Health and Nutrition Center, the NIAP or the National Educators Academy of the Philippines, the ADPTAF or the Educational Development Projects Implementing Task Force, the NSTIC or the National Science Teaching Instrumentation Center, and lastly the IMCS or the Instructional Materials Council Secretariat. Now this time, let us discuss the field offices. Under the subnational level, there are 16 regional offices, including the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or the ARMM, each headed by a regional director, a regional secretary in the case of ARMM. 157 Provincial and City Schools Divisions, each headed by a Schools Division Superintendent. Assisting the school's division offices are the 2,227 school districts, each headed by a district supervisor. Under the supervision of the school's division offices are 48,446 schools, broken down as follows. 40,763 elementary schools that is consisted by 36,234 public and 4,529 in private. While in secondary schools, we have a total of 7,683 broken down into 4,422 for public and 3,261 for private schools. And now we are done with the Department of Education. This time, let's proceed to Commission on Higher Education or CHED. The Commission on Higher Education or CHED was created on May 18, 1994 through the passage of Republic Act No. 7722 or the Higher Education Act of 1994. CHED as an attached agency to the Office of the President for Administrative Purposes is headed by a chairperson and four commissioners, each having a term of office for four years. There are nine powers and functions of CHED. First, they formulate and recommend development plans, policies, priorities, and programs on higher education. Second, they formulate and recommend development plans, policies, priorities, and programs on research. Third, they also recommend to the executive and legislative branches priorities and grants on higher education and research. Fourth, they also set minimum standards for programs and institutions of higher learning recommended by panels of experts in the field and subject to public hearing and enforced the same. Fifth, they also monitor and evaluate the performance of programs and institutions of higher learning for appropriate incentives as well as the imposition of sanctions such as, but not limited to, diminution or withdrawal of subsidy. Recommendation on the downgrading or withdrawal of accreditation, program termination or school course. Sixth, they also identify, support, and develop potential centers of excellence in program areas needed for the development of world-class scholarship, nation-building, and national development. Seventh, they also recommend to the Department of Budget and Management or the DBM the budgets of public institutions of higher learning as well as general guidelines for the use of their income. Eighth, 
They also rationalize programs and institutions of higher learning and set standards, policies, and guidelines for the creation of new ones, as well as the conversion or elevation of schools to institutions of higher learning. Subject to budgetary limitations and the number of institutions of higher learning in the province or region, where creation, conversion, or elevation is sought to be made. And lastly, they develop criteria for allocating additional resources such as research and program development grants, scholarships, and the other similar programs, provided that they shall not detract from the fiscal autonomy already enjoyed by colleges and universities. And this is the CHED organizational structure. This is spearheaded by the Office of the Chairperson and Commissioners together with the Technical Panels and the Board of Advisors. Under this level is the Executive Office, the Deputy Executive Office together with the HEDFS, Office of SUCs and LUCs Concerns. Below this level is the Office of Policy, Planning, Research, and Information, together with the Office of Programs and Standards, and Office of Student Services. Below this level as well are the following Administrative and Financial Services, CHED Legal Services, and International Affairs Services. And the CHED Regional Offices is also under the Executive Office or the Deputy Executive Office. And lastly, let's now move on to the third organization model in Philippine schools, which is the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority or TESDA. The Technical Education and Skills Development Authority or TESDA is the government agency tasked to manage and supervise technical education and skills development in the Philippines. It was created by the virtue of Republic Act 7796, otherwise known as the Technical Education and Skills Development Act of 1994. Overall, TESDA formulates manpower and skills plans, sets appropriate skill standards and tests, coordinates and monitors manpower policies and programs, and provides policy directions and guidelines for resource allocation for the TVET institutions in both the private and public sectors. Today, TESDA has evolved into an organization that is responsive, effective, and efficient in delivering myriad services to its clients. To accomplish its multi-pronged mission, the TESDA board has been formulating strategies and programs geared towards yielding the highest impact on manpower development in various areas, industry sectors, and institutions. This is the last part of my report and Ma'am Wilin will continue the succeeding topics and all the references will be seen at the last part of our discussion. Good morning everyone. I am Miss Wilin Lee C. Sakasak and this is the continuation of the topic Organization and Management in Philippine Schools. This time, I will be discussing to you the second and third intended learning outcomes. The second intended learning outcome is cite and explain specific structures and different organizational institutions in the Philippines. And the third one is analyze the effect of given models of organizations in various Philippine educational institutions. To fully understand the current organizational structures of the institutions in the Philippines, it is indispensable to gain knowledge on the strengths and weaknesses of public education in the country before tackling the structures and different organizational institutions in the Philippines. This is in consonance with the affirmation of Bukharin in 1973, by which he presented the strengths and weaknesses of public schools in the Philippines in his study, entitled Educational Leadership Handbook, 
for Philippine Public Schools. According to Bukharin in 1973, it is significant to detail some of achievements and weaknesses of public education in the past two and one half decades as they relate to the leadership. The succeeding statements present the recorded strengths of public schools in the country, to which one notable achievement has been the strengthening of national solidarity. The unity of the Filipinos has been strengthened by a public school system through a highly centralized organization. The use of a uniform course of study with slight variations to meet the needs of the minority and the use of the English and Filipino languages were cohesive factors. Another achievement has been the training of people for a democratic way of life. The concepts of attributes of democracy were learned in the public schools in various situations and activities. The third achievement considered notable is the training of leaders and the development of a middle class. Nearly all of the educated people of the middle class who have become leaders in various life activities are products of the public school system. And the fourth notable achievement is the development of a wholesome attitude toward work. The preceding statements simply show how the organizations were successfully managed. However, there are some weaknesses in the public educational system. One of the weaknesses is the low holding power of the schools. Another critical area is the problem of inadequate and unstable financing of public education, which affects systematic and long-range educational planning. This problem generally affects the condition of secondary education. The Special Education Fund Act has eased to some degree the seriousness of this problem, but certain amendments to the law are needed. The kind of leadership and initiative generated as a consequence of a highly centralized organization on all levels of education leaves much to be desired. Other factors that are believed contributive to this weakness, particularly of educational leadership, are some of the policies and long-established practices and promotions to higher-level positions in the educational hierarchy, along with the inadequate preparation and training of most school administrators and supervisors who are charged with providing leadership. On this problem, the Presidential Commission to Survey Philippine Education, in its policy recommendations, proposed the following. Reorganization of the Department of Education, adoption of the new policies in recruitment and promotion, and the establishment of education regions with operational authority within the national framework. With this information, we can now fully understand the system where we belong, especially in the Department of Education. Pablo, in 2015, in her article, stated that education is a necessity and a right of every individual. According to her, without proper education, we might find it a bit hard surviving life. She added that most of the Filipinos value the importance of education and are striving hard just to finish their studies for they know that after all those hard works, a bright future awaits them. Pablo also expressed that we are very fortunate to have such laws in our constitution that deals with education. It is stated in the law that it is the government's responsibility to provide quality and accessible education to every Filipino citizen. Undeniably, our government have done it 
for there are public and private schools in the country where students can attend and learn. In the presentation of Pablo in her article, there are three main agencies in the Philippines education that take charge in the different levels, namely the DepEd, CHED, and TESDA. Each agency has its own purposes, duties, and responsibilities to follow and do in order to provide quality and accessible education. The Department of Education is in charge with the elementary and secondary levels. Accordingly, its main function is to provide quality basic education that is equitably accessible to all and lay the foundation for lifelong learning and services for the common good. Basically, the aim of DepEd is to give the students basic needs, competence, and knowledge that they need in life. With their function, it is their responsibility to cater the needs of the students that will guide them in understanding further the complex things that they will be facing in the future. As it was stated, this department should provide the students with the foundation and the basic knowledge that they will be carrying for a lifetime. The responsibility and function of DepEd must be really done simply because it is where the students will be honed and it will serve as a preparation as to what they can experience and go through in their lives. The Commission on Higher Education is in charge of handling the tertiary level. This agency envisions to build the country's human capital and innovation capacity that would develop the Filipino nation as a responsible member of the international community. That, CHED aims to produce responsible, intelligent, and globally competitive graduates. Pablo stressed that there are those people who may not excel much in their academics but are gifted when it comes to skills-based work. Good thing there is the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority or TESDA that provides courses that are skills-based. This is also beneficial for people who cannot afford to pay colleges and universities. This is also for people who are adults old or even those who are not able to graduate from the basic education. In short, this is for everyone who aims to learn and develop such skills. Through TESDA, education is made accessible and available for all, which helps a person to be skilled and equipped with knowledge and abilities that they may use to make their lives bountiful. Truly, this program helps every citizen to make use and develop their technical, vocational, and other skills in order to be successful and, of course, earn money in a legal way. One can be successful in life even without attaining college degrees because patience, dedication, talent, and hard work are the traits that an individual should possess in order to survive. According to Pablo in 2015, our education system in the Philippines may not be as good as other countries, but it is strongly believed that little by little, our education system will be enhanced and developed that will lead into catering the needs of the students. What we need is a great teacher who will inspire and teach well the students to make them better and greater in the future. Though the Department of Education is executing a bureaucratic model of organization and management, the school is empowered to operate with the help of the community. To be specific in our discussion, let us focus on the school-based management or SBM. School-based management 
is the decentralization of decision-making authority in schools. At a school level, school heads, teachers, and students work together with community leaders and local government officials and other stakeholders to improve school performance. Specifically, SPM aims to empower every school to continuously improve its performance in attaining educational outcomes, engage stakeholders in shared decision-making, lead the school staff together with other stakeholders in identifying and addressing school problems and concerns, create support network of community-based stakeholders that will mobilize social, political, cultural, and economic resources, and make stakeholders accountable for school performance. SBM is characterized by shared vision. It is the collective dream of the major stakeholders for the school. It is the unifying and sustaining factor that upholds the values, beliefs, and culture of the school community. And it is the core message and it establishes principles of high performance. SBM is also a shared mission. It is the commitment to pursue necessary tasks in realizing the vision. A shared mission drives the team to undertake actions to effect planned improvements. Another characteristic of SBM is shared decision-making. It means ownership of decisions by a team of stakeholders. It is an effort to transform conventional school organizations into proactive learning communities or LCs. These LCs are thus empowered to make decisions that would strengthen the teaching and learning processes. Another one is collaboration. It is the joint effort of stakeholders in working together toward improving learning outcomes. Next is autonomy. It means stakeholders are free to govern the school as mandated by RA 9155, subject to a step of implementing rules and regulations of the Department of Education. Others call this decentralization. SBM is also characterized by accountability. It is the acknowledgement and assumption of responsibility for all actions, decisions, policies, outputs, and outcomes. Next is community ownership or shared governance. It means the forging of partnership among stakeholders to address the needs and concerns of the school. Lastly, SBM is characterized by transparency. It means an open presentation to stakeholders of school accountability such as fiscal and material resources as well as school records among others. Talking about the effects of school-based management in the Department of Education, SBM has been piloted in the projects implemented in selected regions and divisions in the country. Example of these projects are the 3rd Elementary Education Project or the TEEP, the Secondary Education Development and Improvement Project or the CEDIP, the Basic Education Assistance for Mindanao or the BIM, and Strengthening the Implementation of Basic Education in Visayas or the STRIVE. Experiences of these schools that implemented these projects have proven that SBM could achieve significant improvements of educational outcomes, one of which is increased school effectiveness shown in the performance indicators with focus on pupil-student academic performance. Second, empowered schools with school heads, leading teachers and students in continuous school improvement. 
The third one is strong community linkages resulting to more resources that provide a better learning environment. Fourth, improved monitoring and evaluation practices. And the fifth one, transparent transactions with a deep sense of accountability. And lastly, effective measure in controlling or managing school funds and other resources resulting to improved delivery of school services. Those are only some of the effects of school-based management in the Department of Education. Let us bear in our mind that there is no such perfect system of organization. All we need as managers is to possess a motivational character towards our subordinate that would surely inspire them to do the best in them. After all, the success of an organization lies in everybody's participation. Remember, management is nothing more than motivating other people. Thank you and God bless everyone.